Hi, my name's Kevin Hicks. Welcome to my YouTube channel, The History Squad. Now, today's video is about the Black Death, said to be the deadliest plague in human history. Well, I've got some interesting stories about this, which uh, might kind of turn some of the history on its head. Now, I've always been under the assumption that the Black Death was, in fact, the bubonic plague. You know, the, the one spread by rats, or more specifically, the fleas that live on the rats. This is what I've been taught, and also what is still being said in popular history to this day. Uh, and also, I was taught that there were just two main outbreaks of the plague in England at 1348 and then 1665, which they named the Great Plague. But modern studies have turned this whole thing on its head. What I've discovered is quite fascinating, but it's taught me something. You have got to keep an open mind when it comes to history. It's not always written in stone. So, the Black Death, the bubonic plague. Originated in China, so I understand. It was spread west, though, by a Mongolian army, Yanni Beg, his uh, ruler of a Mongol horde. They are pursuing some Christians who had actually murdered a Muslim soldier. They trap them in the town of Kaffa, lay siege to it, but the Mongolian army is suffering terrible deaths from the plague. So they do the honourable thing and catapult the dead in the town, hoping to spread the disease amongst the Christians, who, come the month of May 1347, have it on their toes and escape. They get straight to Constantinople, which is modern Istanbul in Turkey. But they've taken the plague with them. 90%, think about that, 90% of the population of Constantinople will die. Now, hang on here. If 90% of the population dies really quickly, how can there be enough rats and fleas to spread throughout an entire city so fast? and kill 90% of the population. That's the first kind of warning to Kev. I'm thinking about it, really? But this plague spreads from Constantinople to Sicily, just off that southern tip of Italy in October 1347. It's actually transported by ship. And then very quickly, it spreads up the leg of Italy. By November, it has actually reached France. Hang on a second, that's weeks, isn't it? <laughs> And then when you follow where the plague went, it's always along the trade routes, men who are plying their trade. And then it continues on. It goes all the way up into Norway, across to England. Ironically, it ends up in Iceland, which I find quite strange because there are no rats in Iceland, or at least there wasn't in those days. Modern estimates reckon that the medieval plague wiped out 50% of the population of Europe. That's incredible when you think about it. Also, though, I was always taught that there were just those two outbreaks in England, uh, 1348 and 1665. And yet what I've now learned is the plague raged for 300 years. In fact, in France, it was never free of the plague for that 300 years. It was always breaking out somewhere. So let's have a look into the life of a medieval doctor. Ah, so I'm dressed as a medieval doctor, quite successful, especially when the plague's in town. I can tell you, I have cures for almost anything. I can sell you cures. Well, I'm gonna talk about the cures in a little while. I must just let you know that the church believes that the plague has been sent by God to punish us all for our evil ways. Well, I've got to get to work, so I'm going to take this off. I, I don't want to get any blood, mucus, vomit, you know, the kind of stuff on it. So here I am, just ordinary Dr. Kev. June 1348, the plague arrives in England. Ship has docked in no time at all in Dorset on the south coast near Weymouth, the town of Weymouth. The plague spreads along the trade routes. Now, as I was taught, it was the rats, but rats can't move that fast. This is tradesmen going from place to place. Bristol, London, Gloucester are the three main areas hit in England. So bad in Gloucester, apparently up to 90% of the population died. But the symptoms 
grouping into three. The first little group is a sweating sickness, agony, final stages, vomiting blood, delirious, absolute raging thirst. But then there is another symptom, which is the buboes, as they called it, or the swelling of the lymph nodes under your armpits. Accompanying this could be spots, rashes all over your body. The other symptom, the final one, is the buboes or the swellings between your legs. This was extremely painful, and once these symptoms appeared, the patient would die within days. Now, there is an original quote, I've got lots of them actually, about what the plague was like, but I've got this book, Return of the Black Death, uh, the world's greatest serial killer. We have an eyewitness account in that book, Giovanni Boccaccio. He tells you what it was like. He tells you that, yeah, there was the symptom of the vomiting, the blood, but there's these other symptoms of the rash, the spots all over the body, some big, some small. Then he talks about the swelling under the armpit as big as an egg, an absolute agony, and also in between your legs. And people, once these symptoms showed, within days they were dead. So this plague absolutely deadly and agonizing to the individuals. So there you are, medieval England, 1348, the plague is afoot. And you're a doctor, how do you deal with it? You imagine you're a monk at one of the hospitals, all of these hospitals dotted around Europe and, and England, and there's an outbreak of the plague. How do you deal with it? And it, it's, it's quite terrifying really when you, when you think about it, because people were dying by their thousands. So the doctors, one of the cures. Get yourself the horn of a unicorn. Isn't that great? First of all, you've got to catch it. Apparently, it involves moonlight and virgins. I have no idea. But if you can catch a unicorn, cut off its horn, crush it up, make it into a paste, you can spread the paste on the bupo. Or you can make a drink. You could also get fresh human feces, make it into a paste. Rub that into the bubo. Or if you're wealthy, you can crush emeralds and make them into a drink and drink them. It's crazy, isn't it? But they had no idea. How about this one? The bursting frog. You have bubo under the armpit. Get yourself a frog. You then open the frog's mouth, prick the bubos, connect the frog to the hole, and the frog will suck out all of the pus you know when he's done his job because he will burst just to let you know no frogs were injured during the making of this film the other one is you get yourself a chicken and you pluck the nether regions of the said chicken you then fasten the chicken <laughs> stop <laughs> under your armpit and the clamminess of the skin will draw out the poison they even come up with an idea Oh, my chicken's dead. That if you stood over the vapors coming up from the privy, in other words, the cesspit, the toilet, the evil aromas coming up from the ground would attract the evil inside your body. The fact is, they didn't have a clue. And it will lead to anything up to a half, 50% of the population of Europe dying. But over in Europe, things were changing. Ragusa, which is actually now called Dubrovnik in Croatia. 1348, that town had been devastated by the plague. But they learned something. They learned that the plague was passed on from person to person, from the sick to the healthy. So they come up with the idea that you can't come in to Ragusa. You can't come in until you can prove to us that you're not carrying the disease. So ships will be held out in the harbour. It was eventually uh, rounded up to 40 days. Quarantino. It's where the English word quarantine comes from. And it worked. Quarantine worked. And when you go into slightly northern Italy, there is a, such a sad case of where people broke the quarantine rules. And it was a tradesman a merchant, sorry, who decided to go from his town to Bologna because his business was more important than mankind and he took the disease.
people didn't realize that although they didn't show the symptoms, they were contagious. They, they were spreading the disease, if that makes sense. And he devastated Bologna. And this is something that kind of makes me question the way I've been taught about the bubonic plague, the Black Death. For all these years, I've been told, yeah, it was Yersinia pestis. It was spread by this flea on these rats. And yet the evidence is actually building to show that no, no, even in the day, they knew that if you had an infected person and they coughed on you, it was quite possibly a death sentence. But there were exceptions. So how come then, after all these years, we've been stuck with this theory that the plague was spread by rats? Well, it all boils down to a microbiologist, Alexandre Yersin, born in Switzerland, but he was in Hong Kong, 1894, where there was a terrible plague, and he was trying to get to the bottom, what was this plague? He even had to bribe officials there in Hong Kong so he could have access to bodies, so he could look inside them, who had died from this mysterious illness. And what he discovered was the bubonic plague, which was spread by rats, or to be precise, the rats carried a flea on the back. And when the rat died, the host, the flea jumped to the next rat and eventually it may infect a human being. This flea was called Yersenia pestis and is the rogue of this bubonic plague. The symptoms, swelling under the armpits, under the groin, very painful, very similar to the plague way back in history in Europe, but different because as we know from eyewitness accounts from the day in the medieval times, they already knew that the plague was spread from a sick person to a healthy person by one person coughing at another. So because the symptoms of the bubonic plague are very similar to those of the Black Death, people since Yersin's discovery that the bubonic plague was spread by the rats and the fleas, they have taken the Black Death to be the bubonic plague. And it's interesting because there is a bit of a knock-on effect here to the end of the Tudor period, the Renaissance, into the 17th century. You have the appearance of the plague doctor. Now, the plague mask, it's quite famous, but the fact is they were quite clever because they enclosed the face. There was glass and then the beak. The beak was filled with dried flowers. Anything that has an aroma, camphor, lavender, peppermint, ambergris, clove. This was to mask the smells because the doctors believed that the plague was miasmic. It was the miasma, the bad air, the evil aroma. Yeah, so doctors were beginning to understand that they needed to protect themselves from the plague. But also, they had a waxed outfit, a, a full length coat that went all the way to the ground. They also wore a hood and then a hat on top, completely enclosing the body. They wore gloves. To move the patient's clothing, the doctors used a stick, a cane, just to move clothes to one side. They didn't touch a diseased patient. The doctor's clothing protected him from blood, mucus and vomits that may have been sprayed by a patient. But you imagine you've got the plague. Your armpits are killing you. You're delirious. And when you open your eyes, you're looking straight into the face of the crow doctor. It must have been terrifying. So there were other measures that were brought in place towards the end of the 16th, beginning of the 17th century where if you were one person in a house and you had the plague, you and your family were shut up in the house. Food and supplies will be left on the doorstep and the house will be marked on the front door with a red cross. It's a plague house. Then in other communities, they would actually have pest houses on the outside of the village so that you can be taken from your community and put into the pest house to see if you survived. So they were learning this quarantine business. So you imagine living in the centre of London, 
the City of London, 1665, the plague, the Black Death is at its height. Thousands upon thousands of people are dying every day. How do you deal with the bodies? Great plague pits had to be dug. Cemeteries very quickly became full, so these grave pits were enormous, 20 feet deep. But in some places they could only go down 16 feet because of the water table, water coming up. There had to be six feet of soil above the dead, otherwise the dogs would actually dig down and steal the bodies and devour them. There's the old thing of the, the plague cart coming round, bring out your dead. Well, the people who did that bring out your dead were the poorest of the poor, sometimes the meanest of the mean. There was talk of how they robbed and lots of that kind of thing. But there are a couple of stories about the body collectors. Two carts. The first cart is trundling towards the grave pit. So the grave diggers are all there. And yet the cart trundled past. And when they looked up, the guy sat in the driving seat with the reins in his hand was actually dead. And the horses panic and they gallop off and bodies are being flung this way and that. And then another one, when the plague wagon is coming towards the pit, the grave diggers are there waiting for them, and the wagon just plunges straight into the grave pit. You couldn't make this up for a horror film. You, know, you don't need the zombies or anything. This actually happened. The wagon has tipped upside down. They believe that the wagon driver was killed or had died because they found his whip amongst the dead. But now they've got to get the horses that are upside down in the plague pit, out. They've got to bring the wagon out. This great plague of London, 1665, we know so much about it. And the reason being is you have Samuel Pepys, who wrote Samuel Pepys's diary. And it goes right the way through that terrible plague and then to 1666. It's an incredible read. I've got my own copy. Have a look, it is a real eye opener. There are a few saucy bits in there, so do be prepared. But slightly lesser known uh, than Samuel Pepys is a comment by Daniel Defoe, the famous author. Now, Daniel Defoe, he actually gives you a first-hand account about how the plague was spread. And there are no mention of fleas or rats here. Have a listen. Because of its infectious nature, the disease may be spread by apparently healthy people who harbour the disease but have not yet exhibited symptoms. Such a person it was in fact a poisoner, a walking destroyer, perhaps for a week or a fortnight before his death. So here is somebody at the time acknowledging there was an incubation period where the person appeared to be healthy but they were infectious. And he talks about how they would ruin the life of those people around him, even to the point of breathing death upon them, even perhaps his tender kissing and embracings of his own family. So he's identified there. It's a kiss of death. It is spread human to human. So this book I've been reading, The Return of the Black Death, it's really challenged my knowledge about this whole subject, what I've been taught, what I understood. But uh, there's a modern, a couple of modern studies using the parish registers of the late Tudor period of two towns, well, one town and one village. The first one is Penrith, way up in the north of England in Cymru. I've been there many times, a lovely place. And what they've been able to do is use these new records because it became law in Tudor England that you had to register births, deaths, marriages, all of that kind of stuff, and those parish registers still exist. So, the first investigation, modern day investigation on the plague. Penrith, the Cumbrian town right up the north of England, isolated in those days. And the parish records reveal the death, 25th of September 1597, of stranger Andrew Hogson. And then it tells you how he'd arrived on the 16th of August, 1597. He lodged with the Railton family. And there were no deaths for 21 days until he died. 
but what they didn't know is the incubation period of the plague was anything up to 30 days. So Hogson has in fact infected three members of the Railton family. They in turn infect more members of their own family. And then it widens. Teenagers go to visit cousins and it records how all the way down the line through Penrith for 15 months. You could track all of the infections back to a single stranger. Penrith was devastated by the plague. So the second of our studies takes us to Iam in Derbyshire, tiny little village in the Peak District, I understand. 1665, you'll never guess, a stranger arrives at the village. George Vickers, an itinerant tailor, he lodges with Mary Hadfield in the village and he goes about his business visiting other neighbours, drumming up custom for his business. But then the one day he doesn't come down for breakfast. Mary goes upstairs and George is in absolute agony, delirious, terrible um, thirst, pain. So she calls the local rector there, William Mumperson, and he turns up and knows straight away this is the plague. Now, there is a dark silence hangs over the village. There's the question, has he infected anybody else with the plague? After the funeral of George Vickers, the rector goes into action. He really cares about his people. He's very conscientious. So he enforces a cordon sanitaire, a cordon around the village, a sanitary cordon. That means that nobody can come in, nobody can leave. Now, just before all of this went on, William evacuates his wife and children. But before the cordon is put in place, his wife comes back. She wants to stand by his side. She will help William with the sick, with the dying and with the dead. She will in fact die in the arms of the rector. And to this very day, her grave is still visited in that village of Iam. This cordon, this cordon sanitaire, what a bold move, what a brave move. Nobody can come in the village now, nobody can leave. He's stopping the spread of the disease. Now, the village will quickly run short of supplies. So, a nearby village, Stony Middleton, will bring supplies to Iam, but they will not have contact. Cooklet Delph, like a natural amphitheater, just outside of the village of Iam. And there was a plague stone on the one side where you actually left supplies, then left the area, people from the plague area came, took the supplies in. These plague stones, apparently you can still find them throughout England. When you read the parish registers about Iam, you can see the terrible agony that that village went through, entire families wiped out. But there's one story within uh, so many tragic stories, that of Emmett Siddle. She had survived the first wave of the plague in Iam, but she was betrothed. She was in love with Roland Tor, but he lived at Stony Middleton. He was outside the cordon, so they couldn't meet. So instead, they met at the Delft, that amphitheatre. He will be on one side by the plague stone, she will be on the other, and they would call to each other and have a conversation, waving and so on and so forth. And this went on for weeks. And then one night she didn't turn up and there was nobody to come to the Delft to tell him what had happened. And he had to wait for weeks until eventually the plague abated, the cordon was lifted and he raced to his sweetheart's cottage. But it was empty. She had died many weeks before. It's interesting to reflect that not everybody died from the plague. It would appear some were immune. Look at Samuel Pepys. Daniel Defoe, Mumperson, the rector of Iam, they actually survive. But if you go back to 1349, medieval Norway, there's a story of someone who survived. Yostadel was a little town that had been founded by refugees from the plague. Wealthy people had run for their lives and they founded this town. But in fact, the plague was with them and it wiped them out. The entire family of a little girl, plus all of their friends, everybody in that little town died. The survivor 
a lone girl, we don't know her name, went wild. She lived in the woods. She was feral and people could see her from time to time. Eventually, she was brought back in to the human fold, into society. And she married, grew up quite successful because she inherited all of the land, the entire town, all of the possessions of the people who died. In fact, for about 300 years, her descendants, her family, were amongst the richest landowners of all of Norway. So, to sum up then, this Black Death, this 300 years of plague, if it wasn't caused by the Yersenia pestis, the little flea that lived on the back of the rat that came from China, then what caused it? Now, from what I understand, scientists are working very hard to try and find out exactly what was the Black Death. Bacteria? Virus? Why don't you let me know your thoughts in the comments? I hope you enjoyed our little film and found it interesting. If you did, like, share and subscribe. And don't forget to turn on the all notification buttons because apparently it does work sometimes. But before I go, a quick shout out to some of my Patreon members. Christopher Moore, John Myers and James Turley. Hey guys, thanks a bunch. Bye for now.